Hello, I'm JW. This time, surge protection devices again. Now, this time I'm going to have a look at this thing and also take one of these apart, see what's contained inside and how these things actually work and how they connect to the electrical installation. Now, these particular ones are cheap ones that came from China, only it cost a few dollars, so of course that's why we've got those, so we can uh, pry them apart without uh, wasting huge amounts of money on more expensive ones. But the basic principles, of course, are going to be the same, regardless of whether it's this uh, cheap one or a more reputable brand. Now, previously we had a look at surge protection and why you might want to use it. And uh, this here is a typical uh, example of the sort of thing you might fit into a consumer unit, or a smaller scale single phase installation. Uh, we can see it's got three connections here, line, neutral, and the earth or protective conductor at the bottom. So it does connect between all three conductors. As we saw before, that is important because a uh, transient over voltage or a surge can occur between any combination of these. So line and neutral, neutral and the earth, or even in fact line and earth. So you do need to connect between all three. Now, this thing basically comes with a uh, outer frame like this, just clipped on the usual rail in your consumer unit. And then it has these cartridges which are replaceable in the event of these things failing because these are not permanent items, they do wear out and become damaged as they absorb the energy from surges and these just slot in here. Now in theory you can then uh, replace these after a period of time, but uh, these particular ones are incredibly difficult to get out of there without prying it with a uh, screwdriver from the back, but nevertheless uh, theoretically it's a replaceable component. Now let's just see how these things are actually connected. So we've got three terminals here, and uh, wiring would of course go into these here, just tighten up the uh, screw on the front, so line, neutral, and the earth on the bottom. So uh, the line one here basically just goes through metal contact in here, so continuity there, but of course that does not connect to this one or anything down here. Neutral again is the same, so neutral there goes into this metal contact, it's not connect over there, and again doesn't connect down the bottom either. However, the one on the bottom here, the earth, does go through into here, and also over here. So these two are linked together, the two at the top are not. So when you insert the cartridge here, so it's got a tab on the top and the bottom, with the uh, magic device in the middle, which we'll have a look at in a minute. When that goes in here, you're basically connecting that between the line and the earth, and then when you put this one in, that's going between the neutral and the earth. And the thing which might not be quite as obvious is because these two are linked here, you've also got protection between the line and neutral, which goes basically through here, across the bottom, and then back up here. So you've basically got two of those in series there, which again covers it between all three of those conductors. So regardless of where it is, you've got things obviously connected between them. So on paper then, that's going to look like this. So we've got our line here. Are neutral here and the earth connecting at the bottom and then between here we have one device and here's the other cartridge device here so between the three conductors there any combination of those we've got something in the path so between line and earth for example that would be through like that so you've got the one device in there from neutral to earth you've got going through like that, so again you've got the one device in there. And if it was between line and neutral, then again you've got it going through the first device, through the second, and over there. So it covers all three of those scenarios. Now what's inside those cartridges is that most likely going to be an MOV, which is a metal oxide varistor. And what this is, is pretty much as it says there, it's made from metal oxide, usually uh, zinc oxide or something similar to that. And uh, varistor is essentially a variable resistor. So at normal voltages, which in the case of this one will be the normal mains operating voltage, and it does actually say this uh, on the front here, basically that's uh, 385 volts, then it has a very high resistance. So uh, normal use, very high resistance. And of course, high resistance means uh, no current will flow. So most of the time, these things just sit there doing absolutely nothing and uh, just basically appearing to be a decorative item on the front of the consumer unit. However, this is where the variable part comes in. If there's a surge or transient over voltage, 
then at a certain point these things change from being a very high resistance to a very low resistance. And by low it means it pretty much becomes a short circuit. So what you get then is a very high current which flows through the device and then the energy here is actually released as heat. So in the event of a surge occurring very high current passes through here and then this thing will heat up and that's basically dissipating the energy rather than it going into the installation and damaging whatever's in there. And this is why these things don't last forever because after they've absorbed a certain amount of energy and heated up a certain number of times then the thing inside becomes damaged and doesn't work anymore. And on these it's got a mechanical indicator here which will change to red when that occurs to indicate that it needs to be replaced. Now I might think that putting a short circuit equivalent across the mains is not a good idea but bearing in mind that uh, surges or transient over voltages, as we saw before, the word transient means incredibly short. And as we saw previously, we're talking in the region of microseconds or milliseconds. So although it is effectively putting a short circuit across the uh, two conductors, it's only going to be there for the duration of the surge or over voltage, which again is very short. So most of the time, not going to cause any severe damage. However, it is necessary when installing these things to have some kind of overcurrent device. You don't just want to bang this directly across the incoming supply, because if something did go wrong in here and this ended up being a short circuit, say, all the time, an extremely large current would flow here, basically continuously, and this thing could obviously melt, set on fire, or do whatever. So these things are always used with some kind of protective device. In uh, this style of thing, it's usually a uh, circuit breaker, so a 32 amp circuit breaker, in uh, sort of series with the incoming supply there and some other types might have an uh, internal fuse or something like that. So although these things in theory only work and actually remove the energy for a very short period, it's certainly possible for these things to break and uh, therefore go short circuit and set on fire or whatever, so generally you'd have an uh, overcurrent device to protect those and of course cut off the supply if that actually happened. So the general idea of these things is that it's installed at the origin of the installation for this particular type, so it just sits there in the consumer unit or whatever. Most of the time it's not going to do anything, so line and neutral just go through to the rest of the installation as normal, and of course there would also be the one with the earth there, I haven't uh, shown that here. So that just sits there pretty much doing nothing the whole time. However, if there should be an over voltage, say it was a thousand volts or something there for a very short period, rather than this being a large, uh, very high resistance, this will conduct and then the idea then is that the excess energy, instead of going into the installation and causing damage, because this effectively becomes a short circuit, the current then flows through here, and therefore whatever's up here doesn't even see that excessive high voltage. It purely uh, goes through here. This thing will get uh, fairly warm and the heat will come off and be uh, dissipated. But again, remember this is only for a few microseconds or maybe a millisecond or something, so most of the time that's not going to be a problem. And of course once that uh, excessive voltage has gone away, it goes up to a high resistance again and things just carry on as normal. And then the idea of course is that the high voltage is contained here, doesn't actually go into the rest of the installation, therefore it protects the equipment you've got there from any kind of damage. Now this is actually only one type, and we'll look at the types in another episode, but uh, suffice to say that some of them can be fitted in the origin here, and in some cases you do need to fit additional ones elsewhere in the installation for particular bits of equipment. So uh, this is a fairly simplified view, but uh, nevertheless the principle is basically the same in that the excess energy of the over-voltage transient goes into this and not into your expensive television or iPhone or whatever else you've got connected. Now let's see what's uh, contained inside these things. Now so these are Chinese ones, they're called uh, Zhu Feng, or however that's pronounced, probably not like that. XFD20 these are called, and uh, so these just come in a pair with that... Uh, frame there we've seen before. So of course these are not supposed to be open but uh, nevertheless uh, we're going to open it there. I've had a go at uh, cutting here already so we'll just uh, hack in at the sides so we can pry off the lid and see uh, what magic is contained inside. Now say so if you buy these for your typical consumer unit you're probably looking at anything up to £100 for something equivalent to this. These ones are about $10 delivered from China so uh, certainly not the most uh, expensive in the world but principles of course are pretty much the same. So just busted off the plastic lid there and then we can see what we have inside. So what we've got then, we've got the two connections at the top and the bottom, those just slot into the frame we saw earlier. 
And from those, we've got these uh, braids here coming across to two parts of what's inside. And we also have this green piece here, which is actually the green indicator located on the front here. Now, green on these is normal operation. And it says here, if it goes to red, then of course it means it needs to be replaced. We've got a spring here, and then this metal piece in the centre here, which goes down inside. Now, the metal contacts, as you can see there, just literally slot in there, so that's where your two connections will go. Uh, if we just pop out the uh, green piece there, So this is the indicator, and we can see the top there is sort of red in a kind of fashion, so that in the event of this failing, that red would show in the window. Not particularly well coloured there, but uh, this is a very cheap one anyhow. And then the spring there would, of course, pull that down so that the red shows through the window. And uh, what we've got in the bottom here is basically going to be the metal oxide varista. This one is all potted in a resin. You know, it's just two connections there, one at the top here and one here. So that uh, the current goes through there, that basically will then become conductive of certain voltage, and then it will heat up and uh, therefore dissipate the energy. And the way that this mechanical indicator works is that on here, this tab is actually soldered there. So if this thing say became short circuit and a huge amount of current flowed or it got uh, damaged, this will heat up to a point where the solder will melt. And then because of this uh, piece fitting inside here, once that solder melts, this then will pull out of here, the spring will pull it down, and then it shows red in the window. So it's a very simple mechanism, just relying on that getting very hot, melting and popping out of there, as this uh, may be solder or some other kind of uh, low melting point alloy. And then that just pops out. That, of course, breaks the connection between the two and disconnects it and avoids it setting on fire. And the same, normally you'd have a uh, overcurrent device installed as well. So not a whole lot to see in here. So it's all potted in resin there, and uh, it's also been flowed in afterwards. Metal oxide varistors are generally round blue items, but uh, generally there's nothing to see in those either. It's just a compressed pellet of material with uh, two connections either side. So that's what's inside these things. Certainly not a whole lot. And why some manufacturers sell these things for literally hundreds of pounds is really a mystery. But of course, uh, you'd have to ask them as to why their products are so expensive. I'll just put that piece back in, so that's your green situation there, and then it fails, the spring pulled it down, and then you can see the red appearing, although in this case the red is uh, not particularly wonderful because they've only basically put a bit on the end there with what looks like a pen, so you could actually uh, repair that by just increasing the amount of red there with uh, a, another pen like that. So There we go, good as new now, look. So what should happen is it's green, and then when the spring pulled it down it becomes red, but say so these are cheap Chinese ones, so uh, we don't expect these to be of the highest or even any quality. But that's generally the uh, situation with that. And then the reason it's got the braids there, rather than this direct connection, is allow these things to actually move, because this here is the one that would melt. So of course you do need the uh, this thing to actually be moving independently of the incoming connection, so hence it's got the braid there, so that can occur. And of course the other reason is just ease of manufacture, so they can just uh, spot weld that on and then just slot in the actual connection in there, like that, so they don't have a sort of a solid connection across there. It just makes it easier to assemble there in the factory. And that's how it goes on, and uh, that's pretty much it. And in case you're wondering what sort of resistance these things have, in their default state, or when the normal voltage is applied, it's pretty much infinite resistance, so as if they're not even there. Now, this is another module which we haven't ripped apart, so got the meter here, so basically it's uh, not 0.1 ohms there, it's just the resistance of the wires. If we measure this here just on this uh, multimeter, just place those on the either side, and as you can see, it's basically showing open circuit, so as if nothing's there, so it, it makes no difference whether it's there or not. And that's pretty much what we'd expect. So whilst these things are not doing any kind of surge protection, they're literally sitting there doing absolutely nothing. Now, I'll just do a quick demo of this thing in terms of what its output voltage is. This uh, multimeter has an input impedance of about 10 mega ohms, which should be about here on the scale, so somewhere near the middle. And we should be able to see the voltage here. Now I'm not going to turn the handle at full speed because this goes up to 1,000 and this isn't rated for 1,000, but if we turn the handle slowly, 
we can see even at speed we're getting around 100 or so and if we increase the speed there's sort of 200 volts 300 500 and that's over 600 there so fairly substantial and we'll see the needle is around the 10 mega ohms mark there which again is expected for what you would get from that and if you go to this other setting here this is also voltage but this has a low input impedance of about 100k which on the scale of this is going to be pretty much at the zero mark because it only is down to 0.2 or 200k so in this case we turn the handle we should see it down here we won't see much voltage because this can't put much voltage into anything with a moderately low resistance so just a few volts there and we're seeing the uh, resistance pretty much as zero now what we've got here is essentially the surge protection cartridge two wires from the insulation resistance tester there and then two other wires which just go to the meter here which displays the voltage so to start with we should see what we had before which is around the 10 mega ohms uh, resistance there which is basically the input units of this meter and uh, that would be the case up to a few hundred volts but if we increase the voltage beyond that what should happen is that the uh, resistance here should fall away towards zero and that would be a situation where you've got an over voltage and then this thing is conducting and preventing the voltage from exceeding that and obviously therefore damaging the equipment so regardless of how fast we crank the handle we shouldn't be able to get above sort of four or five hundred volts range depending on exactly what this is rated for so let's uh, just try that out and see what we get so we're fairly slow to start with so getting there to a couple of hundred volts you can see it's around the 10 mega ohms on the uh, scale here on the left so this will be a normal operation where pretty much uh, nothing is happening now if we increase the speed there going up to 300 there now we can see there that the uh, needle here on the device is dropping away as the voltage exceeds that so about 500 volts there and if we go a bit faster you see again the needle is now dropping down towards the one mega ohm point and even if we crank that at considerable speed it's capping the voltage to about 600 volts DC and we told that the uh, resistance was coming back down here towards zero so that's basically what it uh, should be doing now if we just disconnect those and just connect it directly and we'll see again what happens without this in position so if we can start slowly see the volts will increase and as we go faster it's now gone out range of the meter which of course is over the uh, 600 volts and that was going fairly slowly so of course in that case it's allowing it to go way over up to the full thousand or so that this thing will support now this time we'll soon see uh, this could should go up into the many hundreds of mega ohms but once we get over a certain voltage the resistance should drop away back towards zero as this thing starts to clamp that voltage and Effectively, that would be preventing the dangerous voltages going into the installation. So uh, no metering cord this time, so it should go somewhat higher. So start out slowly. And you can see there, that's already up to around 500 mega ohms there. So and that's actually out to 1,000. But if we increase speed, yeah, you can see there it's now dropping down quite dramatically. And if we go faster, it drops down even further but if we slow down again it goes back up into the many hundreds of mega ohms so it just switches between those two states so pretty much open circuit there very high resistance once the voltage increases it drops down to that very low resistance and if we get rid of it completely and turn the handle again it just goes straight up to that high resistance regardless of what speed we actually turn the handle at. So that's how these surge protection devices work. A very simple thing, basically it's just a very high resistance normally. When the voltage exceeds a certain level, this thing will then conduct, which uh, both serves to clamp the voltage to prevent it exceeding a certain level so it doesn't go into the installation and cause damage. And of course, because this conducts the energy from that uh, over voltage goes through here and is dissipated as heat inside so uh, nothing particularly uh, mysterious about these things and they're very simple principle and of course these things do wear out hence we've got the indicator in the front there to show when it has failed and requires replacement 
So that's it for this particular episode. Of course, there will be further ones on how to select these things and what types are available and so on. But until then, thanks for watching.